philosophies like zero-shot learning and few-shot learning, um, and they can generalize across many tasks, many domains, languages, and modalities. And then we can adapt them on certain downstream tasks. And so it's a very fast-moving area. I have a few examples of some of these foundation models, starting with BERT, all the way down to Gemini, which was announced last week. Uh, lots of progress from many different companies, including even startups and smaller uh, companies. Um, and so we've shown that these things are powerful, and they're useful for a variety of things. We're not there yet, but we have made a lot of progress. And this is all great. So the reason why I bring it up is because a lot of people are asking, if we are there, should we use anything that's not public data? These models are trained on wet data, open data, and that begs the question, if they're really good and becoming really powerful a lot of things, does that mean we would never need to use non-public data? And so I'm arguing that we actually do need public data, uh, non-public data. And the reason being, if you look at this uh, diagram, uh, the blue distribution represents the data that these LLMs are seeing. You have your Wikipedia, Reddit, you have a lot of books, blog posts, chats, uh, research papers, so on and so forth. So they're seeing a lot of rich data, and that's why they're being very useful at a variety of tasks across multiple languages and even modalities, and that's great. But these models are not really trained on things that are necessary for things like medical applications, or even applications that we have on our phone, like emails and calendars and chats with our friends. So they're not seeing things like medical patient data. They're not seeing user location data. They're not seeing user chats and emails. And there's obviously a reason for that, which is because these types of data are actually very sensitive. So if you look at all these LLMs, they've made a lot of progress, but if you have noticed since GPT-4, improving upon the accuracy of these models has been quite challenging. And some people argue that even if we throw more compute, more parameters, and even more tokens for training, we're not going to improve the performance of these models by a whole lot. We really need to tap on other sources of data in order for us to make progress in the field. And this is not surprising. At Google, actually, we realized that even before LLMs were very cool. And you can see here for a variety of tasks, going from the Gboard next word prediction to the hot word misrecognition, all the way to smart text selection, whenever we trained on in-domain data, non-web, non-public data, we were able to improve performance anywhere between 10% to 24%. And these are all trained with federated technologies on device. So we're doing it with uh, some privacy preservation. So you can see that this actually, in the industry, is actually well known. It's not just my own opinion or a thought experiment. So rather than saying these LLMs do not benefit from training with in-domain data, I think we should be able to say that high-quality in-domain data is going to be required for improving the efficiency and accuracy of these models in production for tasks. And that's really a key takeaway message. But if, if we've made the case for it, and if we all believe that this is true, then this begs the question of how are we going to obtain this data, and how are we going to do it in a way that's actually privacy-preserving? And so back in 2015 at Google, researchers were confronted by a few choices. Either they would not use any private data to improve these models in production, just use whatever you can get from web data, or you can ignore all the risks, especially the privacy risks, and log the data and use it centrally anyway to train, or you had to invent a new technique, a new solution. And what they picked is to actually invent a new solution, and that's when they uh, popularized this paradigm, which is called federated learning and analytics. And so in this paradigm, instead of shipping the data and putting it on the server and training centrally on it, the way you would have traditionally done, you actually push the computation to the edge, you would train on device, and you would only send model updates. And this is something that I think a lot of people in this room have mastered and uh, advanced over the years. But when we want to reason about privacy of the system, we have to actually ask ourselves the privacy of who? 
there are many actors, all the way from the devices that have the data, to the server itself, to the analyst that's actually uh, submitting that job to train a model or to compute a statistic, all the way to deployment, when we deploy the model to devices for inference. And so we really need to look at the holistic picture. And I think yesterday we were discussing privacy, and uh, probably Michael said that he likes DP because it has this one parameter. It's nice, it's continuous, smooth, but I'm actually going to push back a little bit against it. I'm going to say that boiling down privacy to one number is actually not very healthy because privacy is a lot more than just one thing. It's not a binary quantity, there or not there. It's not a scalar, it's multifaceted and multidimensional. So let me try to explain what I mean by that. I think we need to separate some concerns for the user, for the platform, and for the verifiers. And these concerns may not be always exactly the same and may not always be even aligned together. So we need, for instance, things like more transparency and audit auditability and control. We need to let the users decide if they want their data to be actually used for certain computations. They need to understand what are those computations and they could choose whether they want the data to go into those computations or not. We need to use data minimization, and federated learning is one technique on that front, which is let's not collect anything and everything. Let's try to minimize things as quickly as possible. And then we need data anonymization technologies such as differential privacy in order to ensure that the output of the computation itself does not leak anything sensitive. And finally, we want to be able to verify or falsify some of the privacy claims that we are making. And that is actually very crucial when you train with cryptographic techniques or secure hardware and things like that. So you can see that federated learning by design captures a lot of the data minimization principle. We have minimized data exposure. We're only sending focused minimal updates. We aggregate immediately. We delete all those updates. And then we only share limited things with the analyst that has requested the computation. So you, the analyst would not see the whole trace of model iterates. Instead, it would only see a few snapshots. And then we do single deployment at the end of the day. So we're reducing the amount of data that we're releasing as we go from left to right in this figure. And we could combine federated learning with a lot of privacy-preserving technologies such as secure multi-party computation, differential privacy in all its flavor, whether it's local, distributed, or central. We can do privacy attacks on the system, red teaming, so on and so forth, in order to strengthen and formalize the guarantees of the system. And so one of the things that I wanted to touch on in this talk is how we were able to deploy differential privacy in production and the challenges around it. So DP is something that I'm assuming a lot of you are aware of. It tells you that if you were to train a model on a data set compared to a neighboring adjacent data set that only differs by one record, and we'll define that record in a bit, these two models should look a lot alike. Statistically, they should have very similar distributions because if they have very different distributions, then the absence or presence of that record can be easily detected by an adversary. And so it uses what's known as the max divergence with these two parameters, epsilon and delta, and we want them both to be small. Think of delta as something that's cryptographically small, 10 to the negative 9 or smaller. Think of epsilon as something that should be at least in the single digits, hopefully less than one. So, but we need to really think about what is the unit of privacy here, because I think this is just as important as the definition of privacy itself. When we say we change a record when we go from D to D prime, what is that record? It could be a single training example, in which we call it example level differential privacy, or it could be all the training examples that belong to a single user which we call user-level differential privacy. In fact, in the context of LLMs and language modeling, we can have many different units of privacy. It's not just example level. We can go maybe all the way down to token level, only change one token in a training example. Or you can change the training example, or you can go to user, and so on and so forth. Paragraph, document, um, organization, et cetera. And you can see that as we go from top to bottom, we're getting exponentially stronger privacy units because the protection that we're given using this definition is getting bigger and bigger. Now, in the cross-device federated learning setting, we actually love to use user-level differential privacy because it 
puts the unit of privacy at the user, and that's meaningful, not just a training example or a token. And the way we apply DP is as follows. There's this algorithm called federated averaging, which is very simple. You compute a number of local SGD steps, and then after that, you send the model update back to the server. The server aggregates these model updates across a cohort of users, computes some sort of weighted average for them, and then you keep repeating this process many times. So in order to add DP to it, the one thing you would have to change, or actually two things, is you have to bound the user contribution. So whenever you are done computing those local steps, you would clip the contribution that you're giving back to the server. And then you would add Gaussian noise after you aggregate the clipped model updates. So the application of DP itself is very simple, but the devil is in the details. How we compute the privacy and how we analyze it for the system is quite complicated. And particularly, we leverage what's known as privacy amplification via sampling, which says that if you were to select at random a cohort of users, you get a boost in the privacy because the adversary now has to fight the noise that the server adds, that Gaussian noise, and also the uncertainty in the sample of users that were selected for that round. So you can see why it's adding randomness into the system, so it's helping privacy. It gives us better epsilons. And this actually is very critical. If you look at the figure here, this is for training a simple small language model on the Stack Overflow data set. You see that when we use this amplification via sampling, when we are able to select users at random per round, we get much better privacy accuracy trade-offs. So you see we're training the model test accuracy versus the epsilon, the DP epsilon, and we can get much better accuracy under this uniform sampling. And this has been the bedrock of DP, applying DP to machine learning. But it's actually very difficult in production FL because how would you sample devices uniformly at random? They're not always all available. There's new devices checking into the system and some that are going offline. And there's all these very sophisticated criteria for, for who can check in versus who cannot, depending on whether the device is charging, idle, so on and so forth. So that really meant that the server cannot really track who's there and sample from that pool. So we had to do something about it. And the way we approach this problem is that we took the literally stochastic gradient descent update equation and we unrolled it. And the first thing you observe when you unroll the SGD update equation is that really what you're doing is you're computing a prefix sum over the updates across rounds. So G1 is the update in round one, G2 is the update in round two. So all you care about here is an algorithm that can compute these prefix sums of updates across rounds in a differentially private way. And that is something that it turns out in the DP community has been studied. And there's a variety of mechanisms that allow you to do these uh, continual observation DP mechanisms. But we end up with something that's streaming. So we end up with an algorithm that has a state, unlike the one that I showed you two slides ago where you add independent Gaussian noise across training rounds, this one actually correlates the Gaussian noise across training rounds. So it's a bit more complicated, and we called it DPFTRL. There's a reason for that. I'm happy to talk, uh, discuss it after, after the talk. And so what we were able to do earlier this year is we were able to take all the Gboard language models, it's a family of about 20 models, and train them all again from scratch with differential privacy. So not only are we training them with federated learning, but also with formal provable differential privacy. And in this table, I'm just summarizing a bunch of them. You can see that there's many different languages. You go from German to Spanish and English and so on and so forth. And each language is a population of devices with a certain size, and not all of them will get the same privacy. It depends on how big that population is. That's one key takeaway. If you have a lot of devices from a certain language, which in this example for ENUS, that's English in the continental US, you can achieve a pretty strong DP guarantee. The models we've trained achieve an epsilon of 4.5 with a delta 10 to the negative 10. Whereas if you are in a population that is very small, like the one 
on the fifth row of this table, you achieve an epsilon that's 13, which is weaker. But the good point here is that we're training all of them with DP. And we were able to actually add secure aggregation into the mix to ensure that the server does not see the individual model updates from these clients. It only sees the aggregate model updates. So that was something that we were uh, able to accomplish uh, quite recently. There's a lot in this uh, area. Uh, this is a manuscript that we published two years ago. Michael was the editor for this manuscript and some of the People in the audience are authors on this manuscript. It continues to be relevant today. It has a lot of interesting open questions. And we published a follow-up to it, a field guide to federated optimization with all the interesting constraints on the fairness, robustness, privacy, so on and so forth. Um, but I want to conclude with two thoughts here, going back to the opener, which is LLMs and foundation models. And I want to make concretely two projections. One is that... Federated learning is here to stay, in my opinion. First, even for the foundation models themselves, they're being trained on data from very different modalities and groups and data types. And so these federated algorithms, like federated averaging and variants of it, can actually have the potential of improving the performance and the meta-learning capabilities and zero-shot capabilities of these foundation models. But as we said in the first part of the talk, Foundation models by themselves are not enough. You need to fine-tune them and then customize and personalize them depending on the data sets as we go from public to non-public data sets. And so this is where we probably need to discover ways to shrink the models, to make improvements in terms of memory and compute, push them to the edge. So I believe that federated technologies are here to stay. And the second and last projection I will make is that we may have to change the way we federate. So, so far, we've been thinking about federated learning as we train exclusively on device, and then we send the model update to the server, which aggregates it possibly with multi-party computation and differential privacy. But maybe we need to do something a little different. We keep the algorithmic structure of federated learning, separating user data as the unit that we want to protect against, but now instead of training on device, because these models can become really big in the tens and hundreds of billions of parameters, maybe we can send them and store them securely in a trusted environment. We can use things like secure enclaves and trusted execution environments. And we on the server can have a lot more resources so we can apply these algorithms in that trusted environment and give some sort of uh, re receipt uh, or a certificate that we never computed anything other than what was intended on the data. So this is something we can discuss later today, but I'll stop for now and thank you. Questions for Peter? Sorry for sitting so far off. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a nice talk. So I had a couple questions. Um, one was in terms of FTRL is generally popular, optimal for the online setting, while SGD is in the standard setting. Um, do you know under what cases DP FTRL and DP SGD begin to behave similarly in performance? Yeah, in fact, uh, there's been a lot of follow-up work on the paper that I showed here, the one which we used in production. Um, and today, there's a version of these algorithms that uses what we call the matrix factorization mechanism. And we can prove, theoretically, that the matrix factorization version of these DPFDRL beats DPSGD in all regimes. So mm. any epsilon, it achieves the optimal trade-offs. Nice, nice. Um, the other question was a little more high level. So there's been a trend of using DP, the definition of DP, for problems other than privacy, but still in the broader regime of responsible AI or something of that sort. For example, machine unlearning is a variant of DP. More recently, copyright uh, protection proofs are based on DP. Do you see uh, any specific problems of that sort in the LLM era where DP and its variants could be a uh, motivator to start with? Yeah, in fact, uh, there's a lot of data on the web 
that uh, is possibly protected by things like GDPR's right to be forgotten. And therefore, if somebody puts something on the web and then later on decides that I want to remove this Stack Overflow post or this uh, Twitter tweet or whatever it is, um, how do you do that? Uh, sometimes the people that are scraping the data off the web aren't the ones that can receive that request. Uh, and so there is uh, possibly some case to be made that even the foundation model itself should be trained with something like differential privacy. Maybe not exactly differential privacy, maybe we can debate and discuss the epsilons, but we should do something to make sure that it has not memorized, overfitted to anybody's um, user information. Sure, yeah, 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 fair enough, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, federated learning is here to stay because I use a lot of it and in smart city applications, but also uh, in trying to uh, introduce differential privacy, um, what, uh, I mean, the, the last thought you had there is to, because you're gonna use uh, large language models to to uh, train on the device, and that's, of course, the device is not enough, and uh, resource constraints and so on. Um, I read a few uh, recent uh, work on, uh, on split learning, for instance, where you, where you train the most important part of the data on the device and, uh, and the rest on the server and, uh, and a few other ideas. What's your take on that, please? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm arguing in this uh, that, uh, oh, I think they took out the slides. Um, so, yes, I think that we could train smaller models uh, on device, and then these could be smaller generative models. We can train them with federated plus DP technologies, and then take that generative model, generate synthetic data, and use that into the training of the foundation model, if needed. Uh, it's unclear to me if user data is going to be useful for those foundation models, but definitely once you start uh, customizing the model and going into a specific domain, you need that data. You need to access it in order to get that improvement in accuracy. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much pro that, and I think the discussion right now is how do we do it? Uh, do we use trusted execution environments to train with federated type techniques inside of them, or we continue to do it at the edge? memory trade-offs, compute trade-offs, all that stuff kicks in, and we need to study that. Thank you. Uh, hi, Peter. I have another quick following up question. So you talk about the fine-tuning stage uh, is more for personalization. So could you please comment on the value of doing federated learning in this personalization or fine-tuning stage? Yes, so, so as I said in, earlier in the talk, um, I think these big models that are trained on a lot of data have demonstrated that they have a lot of zero-shot or few-shot capabilities, and that helps, because now we don't have to run a federated uh, training algorithm for days and weeks, which we would have traditionally needed. Now we can actually do just a few rounds of training. So it speeds up the fine-tuning stage with federated technologies drastically. But it's still needed. Without that user data or in-domain data, we would not be able to achieve state-of-the-art accuracy and continue to improve performance on these variety of benchmarks, especially, I think, in the medical domain or in specific domains where we need user data. Um, so I think it's needed. I think it's necessary. We can't just do zero shot. Um, but I also think that the zero shotness or few shotness properties can help us speed things up. We need less training and less data. And so that's actually good, because we don't have to wait for days and weeks to get that model. And that's something that engineers did not like about federated learning, because it slows down the pace of research and development. OK, I'll ask the question. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I want to touch upon the last topic that you mentioned about uh, TEs, and uh, more specifically about TEs and accelerators. So, okay, we've seen um, Intel, SGX, and so on and so forth, uh, but we're only tapping, I think, with the H100s now that they are supporting some kind of enclave in, an, in a GPU accelerator. Now TPUs, I mm -hmm. don't think that they do. How do you see this section, uh, this sector uh, evolving uh, 
talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think, I think first of all, a lot of us here are not hardware security researchers. A lot of us are algorithms, stats, uh, information theory people, right? So I would love for the community to have some sort of a mathematical model for what a TEE is. What are the threats, uh, surfaces of attack, We've probably all heard or seen these side channel attacks, correlations between the data and timing analyses and things like that. Uh, for researchers that are designing algorithms, figuring out precisely what the constraints are in terms of can I just run arbitrarily any algorithm inside that box, any training method, or are there compute and memory constraints, and how do I capture those constraints into the design of some optimal algorithm? There's a lot, I think, that's open in that community. So far, we've just treated them as magic boxes. We can run anything in them arbitrarily, and nothing will go wrong. Uh, but a lot of things can and do go wrong. So we need these threat models, mathematical models, to capture constraints and then design algorithms that are tailored for them. And so we're in the very early, I think, days of TEs. Let's, let's thank Peter. Thank you. So we next have Emmerich. Oh.